I need some air. Ah, much better. In ancient Mesopotamia, Enlil was the god of the atmosphere, or air, and more specifically, the wind. In fact, the word Enlil in Sumerian means Lord Wind, and this would include hurricanes, but also the gentle winds of spring, which were regarded as his breath and also interpreted as his word or command. He was part of a triad of gods, with Enki and Anu, who was the highest god of the Sumerian pantheon, but Enlil had a special esoteric role as an embodiment of energy, force, and authority. Enlil was also the god of agriculture, which was the reason Sumer emerged as a civilization in the first place, as agriculture is what separates people living in small tribes as hunter-gatherers from organizing societies into large civilizations that can achieve great architectural accomplishments such as megalithic structures, pyramids, or build armies and develop technological advances such as metal. I hesitate to call ancient Sumer the first agricultural civilization, although it certainly was one of the earliest of the Holocene, the current geological age we're living in, which started about 12,000 years ago. Because of discoveries made such as Gobekli Tepe, an 11,500 year old archaeological site in Anatolia, or modern Turkey, which features giant stone structures which most anthropologists agree could not have been erected by hunter-gatherer tribes. The problem with finding evidence of earlier agriculture, especially during the Pleistocene, is because the cataclysmic events that ended the Ice Age were so catastrophic that not much evidence could possibly survive the rapidly melting glaciers and severe climate change which caused mass extinctions and altered the topography worldwide. That said, in my books I do claim that agriculture must have existed during the Ice Age based on other circumstantial evidence. First of all, there are depictions of domesticated animals used in agriculture dated to the late Pleistocene, such as horses with bridles around their mouth engraved on mammoth ivory tusks. More importantly, however, the hominid known as Cro-Magnon, which is acknowledged as being the first fully modern human, first discovered in the Pyrenees Mountains between Spain and France 35,000 years ago, is the first and only known specimen that had a chin, which in an anthropological context comes about from an agricultural diet, as opposed to all other hominins that do not have a chin and instead have a mouth that protrudes out from their face, which is considered an archaic and simian feature belonging to a hunter-gatherer lifestyle and diet. So even without having direct evidence, such as the remnants of an ancient farm, I was able to deduce from archeological evidence, such as the pre-Sumerian megalithic structures of Anatolia or the animal domestication of the Ice Age, or the fossil evidence apparent in the skull structure and massive cranial capacity of Cro-Magnon, that indeed agriculture existed before the cataclysms that ended the Ice Age. And this reinforced the probability that the myths and legends about ancient seafaring empires such as Atlantis were true and genetically debunked political propaganda such as the out of Africa hypothesis were being promoted as part of an unscientific, egalitarian agenda. So, I wasn't surprised at all when research started being published that evidence of farming has been discovered dating back 23,000 years, almost twice as long ago as the demise of Plato's Atlantis or of Gobekli Tepe. An article in the Science Daily goes on to say, quote, until now, researchers believed farming was invented some 12,000 years ago in the cradle of civilization, Iraq, the Levant, parts of Turkey, and Iran, an area that was home to some of the earliest known human civilizations. 
a new discovery by an international collaboration of researchers from Tel Aviv University, Harvard University, Bal Ilan University, and the University of Haifa offers the first evidence that trial plant cultivation began far earlier, some 23,000 years ago. While the term trial plant cultivation is not the same as full-scale agriculture, The study shatters the previous paradigm regarding early farming and gives the scientific community reason to rethink what it previously believed our ancestors were capable of. The site where the cultivated plant material was discovered shows evidence of systematic cultivation with traces of over 140 species of plants, including 13 known weeds mixed with edible cereals such as wild emmer, wild barley, and wild oats. While the article did not mention it, I would speculate that these people also cultivated beer. The researchers did find a grinding slab, which is a stone tool with which cereal starch granules were extracted, as well as seeds scattered around this tool, a sign that the cereal grains were processed for consumption. Specific scarring on the seeds indicate the likelihood of the cereals having been grown in fields, and the presence of sickle blades indicate that these people deliberately planned the harvest of cereal. In ancient times, the sickle, which is a single-handed hook-shaped tool, was associated with the woman, as harvesting was linked to females. The men were the ones that were blacksmiths, working with metal, and so symbolically associated with the hammer. This is the esoteric meaning behind the hammer and sickle, which prior to communism carried a religious significance to early philosophies retained into modern times by secret societies. If you were to look this up, most sources would likely claim that the hammer stands for industrial laborers and the sickle stands for the peasantry, and combined, they symbolize the power of workers and peasants. But before the Bolshevik Revolution, before communism or Karl Marx, the sickle, which also represents the lunar crescent, symbolized the female sex energy, and the sword, thunderbolt, or hammer, The emblem of Thor represents the male member or is a phallic symbol, which are portrayed together much in the same way that the Star of David or Seal of Solomon in an esoteric context represents a triangle or pyramid as fire and the upside down triangle represents the female or water. In alchemical traditions, mystery schools, and ancient religions, The male and female energies were combined in sex rituals or fertility rites to bring about a third energy, which was usually depicted as a child, part of a triune of deities, such as Isis, Osiris, and Horus. Or it was expressed as a flame, such as the one that sits on the head of the androgen Baphomet, which is a combination of male and female attributes. Or in the case of the hammer and sickle symbology, this flame here in a North Korean emblem, which can also be seen here in the middle. Many people are aware of the famous biblical tale in Genesis of the Tower of Babel, which according to the story, a particular race was once united following the Great Flood, speaking a single language, who decided to build a city and a tower tall enough to reach heaven. God, observing their city and tower, confused their speech so that they could no longer understand each other and scattered them around the world. While I already covered ancient languages in prior videos, which I will leave a link to in the description, if one were to try to make sense of these origin myths in a secular or anthropological context, I think it's clear that the original root language, which was, according to the Bible, 
scattered or diffused to other parts of the world from the Middle East was Aryan or Indo-European. I prefer to use the word Aryan because unlike the term Indo-European, it was etched on stone cuneiform thousands of years ago and appears in numerous ancient texts, but is no longer used since World War II despite its academic accuracy since many Western governments which to a large degree are influenced by ancient secret societies, seem to have an agenda now to replace the old world order established by the Aryans with a new world order that does away with the concept of race, gender, social class, the family unit, or political parties. One needs only look at the architecture of the European Union's new facility in Strasbourg and compare it to a painting of the Tower of Babel to see the similarities. The founders of the European Union used this Renaissance painting of the Tower of Babel on some of its posters over the years with the phrase in French, quote, many tongues, one voice. As members of the European Parliament knew what the Tower of Babel was and what it meant. While some have said that the 12 stars on the European Union flag are meant to signify the crown of Mary, in the Babylonian culture, the Queen of Heaven was the title given to the earthly mother of Nimrod, builder of Babylon. There is also a sculpture of the Woman on the Beast, which is the main feature on the outside of the building of the Council of Europe in Brussels. The Woman on the Beast is mentioned twice in the Bible, in Revelation, chapter 13 and 17, and in Greek mythology represents the rape of Europa, the Phoenician princess whom the continent of Europe got its name from. Zeus, having turned himself into a white bull, abducts her and carries her off to the island of Crete, where one of the earliest, if not the earliest, advanced European civilization was established, which we call the Minoans. In Greek mythology, Minos was the king of Crete, a son of Zeus and Europa, and was famous for the Minotaur, which was half man, half bull, and means bull of Minos. In ancient Babylon, Phoenicia, and other civilizations for that matter, the crown with the bull horns was a symbol of the sun god during the age of Taurus, a roughly 2200 year period preceding the Aryan age. While mainstream anthropologists attribute the zodiac to the Babylonians, including the procession of the equinox, the roughly 26,000 year cycle known to the Greeks as Plato's Great Year, I would contend that like agriculture itself, the actual origins of the zodiac can be traced back into the Pleistocene or Ice Age, back to, you guessed it, Cro-Magnon, which gets its name from the big cave where the remains were discovered, that incidentally is filled with ancient paintings of animals, which are dismissed by most mainstream academia as merely art, but upon closer inspection, it appears that the unofficially agriculturalist Cro-Magnon painted a zodiac on the walls of the cave, which showed the formation of the sky during the Pleistocene and the same symbol of the bull to represent Taurus, which is attributed to the Phoenicians, Babylonians, and other people descended from the Caucasian or Aryan civilization, which diffused during the Holocene, the direct descendants of Cro-Magnon. At first sight, the night sky is made up of thousands of stars arranged randomly. But when you look closer, some stars are more visible than others. They're brighter. These stars were recorded very early on in history. The Babylonians grouped them into 12 constellations. The constellations of the Zodiac. If you observe the sky long enough, the stars appear to move around an imaginary axis running through the North Pole. Did Paleolithic man observe this phenomenon, picking out groups of stars, and then mentally project the images of familiar animals 
onto underground walls. The cave might be far more than a gallery of 600 odd paintings. The very shape of this dome, the belt of the zodiac in the sky. One figure, a large bull, and the Aldebaran star. If the hall of the bulls were in glass, you would see the constellations behind them. In antiquity, the Pleiades was known as the Seven Sisters and is a cluster of six or seven stars that are visible to the naked eye in the constellation of Taurus. In the main hall of cave paintings by Cro-Magnon, there's a group of dots on the back of the great bull, which I contend represents Taurus, that resembles the six or seven stars of the Pleiades, which also represents Europa riding on the back of Zeus, the bull. In a future video, I will cover the esoteric significance of the star Aldebaran that is portrayed as the eye of the bull of Taurus, which has a special place in German mythology, especially before and during World War II, linked to the medium Maria Orsic. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those who are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments, so please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.